Well, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to call this meeting of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to order. Today is Wednesday, March 6, 2024. The time's 9.30 a.m. With us today are Commissioners Bobby Janeka and Katerina Gonzalez, as well as our General Counsel, Mary Smith, and I am John Nearman. For those um, of you who are just coming in, let me um, let you know if you want to address the Commission, you can register at the table out front, or if you're joining us virtually, you can uh, register to address the Commission at agenda at tceq.texas.gov. Um, and uh, in that email, please include your name, your affiliation, and the item that you'd like to comment on, and we will do our best to accommodate that request. Um, I or our general counsel will advise speakers of their time limits. And I do have one public service announcement before we get going today, and that is you may have noticed some construction around here. And uh, that means that we are going to be displaced from this room for several months. And um, so our next meeting will not be in this room, um, nor, as it turns out, will it be at our normal Wednesday morning time. So our next meeting will be on Thursday afternoon, March 28th at 1.30 p.m. And we're not absolutely certain of the location yet. Um, it is likely that we'll be um, down in the Capitol Complex at the Workforce Commission. That's on 15th Street. Um, but I'm going to say this a couple times. Check the agenda notice um, for that meeting. And we will be in whatever place the agenda and place and time the agenda notice specifies. Um, the room that we're looking at at the Workforce Commission seats at least 60 people, um, but certainly nowhere near the 180 people that we can accommodate in this room. Um, so we are looking for a room that's both larger, but that will also allow us to um, bring all the technology and use the technology that allows us to have virtual meetings. So that, that is our project right now. Um, if we are, in fact, in the Workforce Commission meeting room, I would encourage folks to consider joining us virtually or, if you need to be present, uh, showing up early so that you're uh, ensured to have a seat. Or you, let me put it this way, so that you have a better chance of having a seat. Um, again, check the agenda notice to uh, confirm the location of that meeting. Um, I think with that, um, we're ready to call the first item. Item number one is the consideration of a motion to overturn filed by Garwood Irrigation Company, LLC, regarding the executive director's amendment of certificate of adjudication number 145434, held by the Lower um, Colorado River Authority. The movement should speak first, followed by the applicant, the ED, and then OPIC. Parties will each have five minutes of oral argument time and should present in the following order, movement, applicant, and then um, ED, and then OPIC. The movement may time, um, save time for rebuttal as they bear the burden of proof. I believe we have um, Ms. Molly Cagle here for the movement. Good morning, Ms. Cagle. Good morning, Chairman. I'm not sure if your mic is on. You want to check the, the push button and get a light there? How about now? Perfect. Back up. Uh, Chairman Yearman, Commissioner Gonzalez, Commissioner Janeka, my name is Molly Cagle, and also the uh, Honorable General Counsel. My name is Molly Cagle. I'm here representing Garwood Irrigation Company, LLC. I hope that the pleadings that I provided to you um, had sufficient defensive drafting and defensive writing that you know why Garwood is so interested in this matter. But just in case you don't, I have two things I would like to relay to you. Uh, first of all, in my two minutes that I'm taking this morning. First, there's a lot of history here for Garwood Irrigation Company. This permit is the, the jewel, I think, of LCRA's collection. It certainly was the jewel of Garwood's water rights. It's the most senior and the largest single run of river water right on the Colorado River. November 1st, 1900, uh, 168,000 acre feet is the water right that uh, Garwood owned and used um, to provide water to farmers in Colorado County for almost 100 years. In 1998, 35,000 acre feet of that water was peeled off for Corpus Christi, 
And in 1998, we had a historical agreement between LCRA and Garwood to sell to LCRA the Garwood water right, but critical in the contract for sale. And as recognized in the preamble to the water right was the importance of the farmers in the Garwood Irrigation District um, long term. Garwood Irrigation has the first 100 acre feet priority right of that water right. And so we're very interested in making sure that things like the Amendment E didn't touch topside or bottom the canal diversion system. The second thing I want to tell you, make sure I get across this morning, is I think that in your packets you have the full briefing that I presented, the full briefing from the executive That's two minutes. director and OPIC. What you probably don't have is LCRA's supplemental filing in which they basically agreed with Garwood that the amendment should be made. I'll reserve my time. Thank you, Ms. Cagle. Okay. And then uh, Mr. Greg Gamel for LCRA. Good morning, Mr. Gamel. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. My name is Greg Gamel, and I'm here representing the Lower Colorado River Authority, the applicant, and the owner of the water right that is the subject of this motion. As LCRA has stated in its filings, LCRA believes that the water right, when read as a whole, imposes no in-stream flow requirements at or below the original diversion point of the Garwood right, which is the location where LCRA diverts water to serve its customers within the Garwood system. The language at issue has been included in the water right since LCRA first amended it to add new diversion locations in 2018, and the TCEQ approved accounting plan is consistent with that reading. The only amendment LCRA requested in this proceeding was to authorize diversions within a river reach from Austin to Bay City, which increases our flexibility to meet customer demands. Now that overall reach includes the stretch of the river from the Garwood diversion point down to the Wharton Gauge. For that stretch of the river, LCRA understands Garwood Irrigation Company's concern to be that the water right might be misconstrued, notwithstanding the executive directors and LCRA's intended meeting. The proposed clarification of Garwood Irrigation Company is very narrow. It would not change the authorizations or conditions in the water right. And by making the clarification in the specific special condition where the in-stream flow values are provided, it could more accurately define the applicability of the in-stream flow requirements, and therefore it could help avoid future misinterpretations. The requested clarification is also, it also appears consistent with the types of changes that could be made by the executive director under TCEQ rules to state more accurately or update any provision in a permit without changing the authorizations or requirements. While that rule or a subsequent application from LCRA might provide a mechanism for effectuating the clarification, we're here today with the opportunity to resolve this issue involving a very important part of LCRA's water right. And thus, LCRA asks that you do approve the motion. Finally, if the motion is approved, we ask that the amended water right 14-5434G not be withdrawn until a clarified amendment is simultaneously reissued. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grammel. Now the ED. Good morning, Commissioners, General Counsel, Public Interest Counsel. My name is Ruth Takeda. I'm an attorney with the Environmental Law Division, and I'm here representing the Executive Director or ED. With me is Dr. Kathy Alexander from the Water Availability Division. The Executive Director opposes this motion to overturn the ED's action on this application because the action taken was appropriate and there is no need to correct or revise the water right. LCRA applied to amend its water right. ED program staff appropriately processed the application. The Executive Director appropriately issued the water right, amended as requested, and the water right provisions are correct and clear. The ED believes the water right provisions are understandable, and if questions arise regarding water rights, assistance is readily available from TCEQ. Garwood Irrigation Company seeks to change a provision in LCRA's water right that has been in effect for approximately five years. In 2018, LCRA negotiated a settlement agreement with protestants opposing an amendment application LCRA had filed in 2003. 
The protesting parties withdrew their hearing requests in that case. TCEQ docket number 2016-0531-WR. SOA docket number 582-17-0553. And the amendment was issued to LCRA in May 19, in 2018. In January 2023, LCRA applied to amend its water right solely to authorize a diversion reach. LCRA had the opportunity to review and correct the ED's draft water right amendment prior to the application being sent to notice. After notice, ED program staff processed the application as uncontested because no one filed a hearing request or commented on it. The e executive director amended LCRA's water right and authorized the diversion reach as requested. LCRA now indicates in its response to Garwood's motion that it wishes to revise its water right based on this motion. The ED respectfully recommends that the commission deny the motion because the executive director's action on this application was correct. <sighs> LCRA, as a water right holder, may request an amendment to accomplish any revision. The amendment would ensure continuity of the water right as desired by, by LCRA and would also avoid confusion regarding the simultaneously reissued water right contemplated by LCRA in its response and in this presentation. We're available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Takeda. Um, can you describe to me what, what um, you know, how that simultaneous reissue would work? Or, or, or let me put it a different way. What are your concerns about that? We're concerned, uh, Chairman, that it wouldn't work. We have not um, had a request for simultaneously reissuance of a water right. So we're not quite sure what LCRA means by that, first of all. And secondly, I think the continu continuity that we believe would be accomplished by an amendment is to have a clean record rather than um, essentially amending an application through an MTO procedure to present a new one. We could process that, have an opportunity for the uh, water right holder to review that draft again, and to make sure this time that all bases are covered. How would it be different moving, you know, we're talking about really moving from one authorization to an authorization that's a little bit different, um, which happens all the time in terms of permit renewals or permit amendments. How, how would this one be, be different? Or why would you handle this one on an MTO differently than you would a normal amendment? Well, this MTO was initiated not by the water right holder. The request to amend the language didn't come from LCRA originally, even though upon reflection, LCRA now agrees that perhaps it could be worded a little bit more clearly uh, so that was our concern. Even though this change looks like something innocuous and reasonable, it's contrary to what we've done before, and it opens the door for future amendments to have other parties, other persons, file more MTOs about provisions that have been in place for a, a length of time in a water right. And so it's bad precedent in that respect. So I, I don't know that I've fully address your question, but those are some of the concerns of the program area. Appreciate your answer, Ms. Takeda. Colleagues, any other questions for ED staff? All right, thank you. Next, we have OPIC. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners, General Counsel and Executive Director. My name is Eli Martinez, and I am with the Office of Public Interest Counsel for the record. We've reviewed the motion to overturn submitted by Garwood Irrigation Company, and we recommend that the commission grant the requested relief. We're a fan of clarity. Clear provisions serve the public interest by saving time and money for those potentially impacted by the water right at issue and spare them from having to litigate misunderstandings or for the right to be construed other than in the manner in which it was intended. While many ambiguities may be difficult to anticipate in the case of Special Condition 4E, the movement has identified a scenario in which that condition could be misconstrued to independently impose stream flow restrictions on diversions at and downstream of the canal system diversion point, um, and therefore no diversions would be authorized at any point on the Wharton Reach uh, based on stream flow requirements. This is contrary to the party's agreed upon intent um, of the permit, 
And as I indicated in our briefing, we found that the clarification sought by Garwood is reasonable, does not impact the protectiveness of the originally articulated permit, and effectuates a useful clarification to special condition 4E. And for these reasons, we continue to recommend that the commission grant Garwood's motion. Thank you. We're available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. I have none. Any questions, colleagues? Seeing none, Ms. Cagle, you have, I think, just a little bit under a minute for rebuttal. Uh, thank you. Oh, forgive me, three minutes. I'll talk very slowly then. Um, <laughs> I wanted to give you a brief explanation of how it is that this awkward wording got past Garwood five years ago. Uh, Bruce Wassinger, may he rest in peace, was a lawyer at LCRA um, at the time that the application for the E amendment was submitted. And he came to Garwood's offices with a copy of the application. And he explained to Garwood that they were not going to touch, top side or bottom, the canal diversion. And we took Mr. Wassinger at his word, as we do LCRI generally. And um, we didn't review the permit when it came out. And we didn't review it until we got the second amendment and which superseded the previous amendment and put it all together. And it was at that point that you could see that B had the exception, E looked like C and D, and it didn't have the exception, and it used, it referred back to B, but it also had an and. And we scratched our heads for a long time trying to figure out what that meant. I, we have attached to our MTO a reply, an order that we think the commission could either direct the executive director to issue or issue itself. And I would like to yield a minute to, or two. It's not Garwood's permit. It is LCRA's permit. And the concern that they have is quite legitimate and quite genuine. And if, if Greg wants to address his concern, if any, about the simultaneousness of the replacement permit, I, I invite him to do so, but I am not concerned with it. Thank you, Ms. Grammel. I mean, Ms. Cagle, Mr. Grammel, do you have anything to add? No. Okay. And I'm happy to respond to any questions. Okay. I, I have none. Any questions? All right. Thank you, Ms. Cagle. Thank you. All right, colleagues, um, we don't have a substantive dispute here. What we have is a concern about um, a potential potentially confusing language, question about interpretation at some point in the future. Um, I think those concerns are, are reasonable. Um, and I don't see a, a true downside to a clarifying amendment at this point. So um, I, would, um, I would overturn 14-5434G and issue an amended certificate to include the proposed clarifying language. Commissioner Janeka? I, I agree. I would uh, I have a m motion I would be prepared to present. I, I agree as well. I move <clears throat> that we overturn the Executive Director's amendment to lower Colorado River Authority's certificate of adjudication number 14-5434G. I further move that we issue amended certificate of adjudication number 14-5434H to lower Colorado River Authority, correcting special condition 4E and issue the amendment as reflected in the revision submitted by Garwood Irrigation Company in Attachment A to their February 15th, 2024 reply with the following modifications. A, replace the term, quote, withdrawing, unquote, and, quote, withdrawn, unquote, on pages two and three of the revision with the terms, quote, overturning, unquote, and, quote, overturned, end quote. B, modify the date the certificate of adjudication is granted on page one to March 6th, 2024, and C, correct the signature block and date issued on page nine to reflect the commission's issuance. And I finally move that we maintain LCRA's certificate of adjudication priority date of November 1, 1900. Is there a second? I make the second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next item. Uh, 
Item number two is the consideration of a petition by White Oaks Ranch Land LP for creation of the White Oaks Municipal Utility District of Denton County. The parties have been notified that the commissioners will not take oral argument, but may ask questions. And those who have signed in will be noted for the record. So colleagues, as you know, we um, evaluate requests for contested case hearings on mud creation petitions under chapter 55, subchapter G of our rules, which requires the commission to grant the requests of affected persons, that is persons who have filed a timely hearing request that identifies a personal justiciable interest not common to members of the general public and that identifies the requester's location relative to the activity that is the subject of the application. And um, in addition, we do not refer specific issues uh, on mud petitions. On this item, we have dozens of requests. Most are from individuals who failed to identify an individualized interest or personal concern. Some fail to identify an issue that's within the commission's jurisdiction on this type of petition. For example, um, issues such as whether the parcels conform to land use um, ordinances that's outside our jurisdiction on this type of petition as our concerns about noise and property values and, and so on. Um, a few of the requesters also failed to provide an address or otherwise identify their location uh, relative to the proposed MUD. So we have to deny those requests. There are, however, several requests that, in my view, um, have met the requirements, um, are affected persons, and are entitled to a hearing. Um, and I'm happy to read those into a a motion, if you like, and discuss on the other side, or invite any other comments at this point. I uh, came down reasonably in the same space and would be happy to go over a list of uh, individual parties or uh, review. Or I can invite motion. you to read a motion. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I like that. <laughs> I'll let I'll let I'll let either of you read a motion. If you haven't, Commissioner, please uh, go right ahead. I move that we grant the hearing requests of Mark and Terry Atchison, Kelly and Philip Eggers, Darlene Freeman, Robert and Helen McGraw, Sean and Dennis Mills, Jason Poole, Paul Queen, Capital Properties 2017 LLC, BNR 2012 Holding Company LLC, Anthony Scarmardo Jr., uh, David and Bonnie Silva, and Nancy and John Tague, and that we deny all remaining hearing requests and refer the petition to SOA for a contested case hearing. That captures uh, how I came down, and I second that motion. Same here. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next item. Item number three is the consideration of a petition filed by Hayes Commons Land Investments LP for the creation of Hayes Commons Municipal Utility District. The parties have been notified that the commissioners will not take oral argument but may ask questions. And those who have signed in will be noted for the record. All right, colleagues, again, for standing, we are looking for requesters who have demonstrated uh, personal effectiveness. Associations can have standing if, among other requirements, they identify a member of the organization who would have standing in their own right. And governmental entities would need to show a statutory authority or other interest in the application. Um, so let me begin with the, the governmental entity requester. That is the city of Hayes. The city identifies several interests that are relevant to district formation, including uh, the city's authority to protect public health and safety and to regulate development within its um, extra territory, extra jurisdictional territory. Did I get that right? ETJ. Extra, ter extra territorial Jur jurisdiction. Thank you. I always call it ETJ and I've transposed those <laughs> letters in my notes. Uh, forgive me. Um, the city also has an interest as a provider of sewer services, um, which raises questions about regionalization 
And because of the overlapping um, with the ETJ, there are uh, questions about the city's consent. So the bottom line on this one is that I would grant the city's request. Um, turning to the associations, we have three requests. Uh, Save Our Springs Alliance identifies Jim Camp as a member who would have standing in his own right. Mr. Camp expresses economic, property, personal health and safety interests, and he resides just under a mile. Um, I have 0.89 miles from the proposed district. And if this were an air application or a wastewater application, Mr. Camp might be able to demonstrate effectiveness. Um, but the question on a mud petition, what's before the commission, is um, whether the mud will be practicable, feasible, um, whether it is necessary and a benefit to the land. So we consider the, the availability of, of other services, the costs imposed on property owners within the district, and whether dr district formation will have unreasonable effects with respect to the land. And that's primarily the land within the district. Um, given the distance of Mr. Camp's property to the proposed district, I don't think he's identified a particularized interest relevant to district formation. Um, turning to the other two associations, the Greater Edwards Aquifer Alliance and Save Barton Creek Association, both fail to identify a member who, have, uh, who would have standing in their own right. Uh, their requests um, um, don't meet this element. The organization offers, uh, both offer replies to cure the deficiencies, but in my view, their request didn't present an ambiguity to be clarified in the reply. They just simply omitted a necessary element to establish standing. So I would deny their request for failing to provide sufficient individual member identification. Um, turning to the individuals, we again have dozens of requests, many of them, and this analysis is similar to the last item, many of them fail to, um, to identify how they would be personally affected, or they identify issues that are outside our jurisdiction, or no issues at all, um, or they live too far from the proposed district to be personally affected. So um, requests that fall into those categories have to be denied. Um, again, I did find several that, that meet our requirements. Um, so I'm happy to invite your reaction to any of the analysis I just laid out um, or to read a motion and discuss it on the other side, however you'd like to proceed. Commissioner Janeka. I appreciate your analysis in detail. I came down uh, consistently how you did with a slightly different view on the, the latter two associations, uh, Greater Edwards Aquifer Alliance and Save Barton Creek Association. I think the uh, provisions in our rules that allow requesters to clarify and provide further information in our reply, which uh, I believe one of OPEC's filings <clears throat> acknowledged and, and invited, the, the applicant, hey, we, we can't make a decision or determination based off the information you provided. Uh, I, I think that arrives to us as a policy consideration. And uh, so looking into those in a little more detail, uh, out of uh, a, a, a path of analysis, wanting to make sure that our decisions, our agency's decisions don't put us in, uh, in jeopardy of coming before court and they find that one of those parties should have had a chance to, to join in. All this said, all this to say, I, I want to recognize uh, SOA's demonstrated uh, interpretation of the of the state law that they operate under a different set of requirements on who part what parties can participate in hearings. I think they've shown that they're they're more uh, more willing to consider parties' requests, and so where we we act appropriately in in following the state state statute, there may be differences in how those come down, and so this may all be moot. I don't want to over over focus on this issue. So I'll pause and see if y'all have interest in, in fleshing it out a little bit more <clears throat> before I do that. Commissioner Gonzalez. Um, I agreed with you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I found that those two organizations failed to identify individual members in their hearing requests, which did not afford the other parties an opportunity to inform the commission of their position on this basis for the organization's associational standing. And uh, given that our rules explicitly state that identification of members with standing in their own right is an element of associational standing. 
I do not believe that the Commission should consider a list of members provided at the reply stage to be a mere clarification or supplementation. I believe that the reply should be used, for example, to clarify how an already identified member has standing. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I agree with, uh, with both of you in a sense. I agree it is a policy question. I have the same concerns about um, affording an opportunity to, to, for the, for the, in the response to the request to, to address the issues and not to be surprised at the reply stage. And you know, some of these are closer calls than others, um, but um, um, you know, none of that changes my perspective on where I landed on it. So um, may I read a motion? Please do. Okay. Um, colleagues, I move that we grant the following hearing requests. The City of Hayes, Molly Blake, Philip Brisky, Carol and Roy Gordon, James Jackson, Stacy Knight, Teresa Clements Lamont, Tina Latham, Tom Lamont, Linda and Gerald McKnight, Matthew Mocha, Doyle Schultz, Darlene and Michael Starr, Ted Thayer, Antonio Valdez, and Lydia Brian Valdez, Michael Stephen Warnkin, Royce Warkin, Warnkin, and Keith Whittington. I move uh, that we deny all remaining hearing requests and we, that we refer the matter to SOA for a contested hearing on the petition. I'll second the motion. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next item. Item number four is consideration of the application by Chenier Land Holdings LLC for the renewal of TPDS permit number WQ0004646000. The parties have been notified that the commissioners will not take oral argument but may ask questions, and those who have signed in will be noted for the record. All right, colleagues, we have a threshold issue on this item, and that is whether this is, you know, what we refer to, and it's not a perfect uh, moniker, but we refer to as a so-called no increase renewal. That is um, amendments and renewals that meet the requirements or satisfy the elements under the Texas Water Code section 26.028D and 30 Texas Administrative Code section 55.201I5 such that there is no right to a contested case hearing. And on this item, my analysis aligns with the executive director and the Office of Public Interest Counsel's analysis that there is no right to a hearing. The applicant seeks to remove all waste streams from its discharge except for its stormwater. The applicant will no longer discharge treated domestic wastewater or leachate or wash water. Accordingly, this amendment will not increase the quantity of waste that is discharged. Just the opposite, it will reduce the discharge of pollutants. The hearing requesters argue that the amendment significantly increases the quantity of waste authorized to be discharged, suggesting that the amendment allows an unlimited or infinite discharge of enterococci. I don't think that argument fits the facts of this application uh, or the law. The facts are that the applicant no longer um, already um, decommissioned and no longer discharges <clears throat> domestic wastewater, so it no longer needs an authorization to discharge enterococci because it has eliminated the waste stream that is known to introduce that bacteria. The draft amendment does not raise the ceiling on the authorization, it eliminates the authorization. And to be clear, an authorization to discharge stormwater is not an authorization to discharge an unlimited quantity of enterococci. So colleagues, I would deny the, the uh, hearing requests. Commissioner Janeka. I think I departed with you at the at a point in analysis on whether it's a no increase in new renewal. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned the application doesn't meet the requirements of the noise, no increase renewal under Texas Water Code Section 26028D because uh, it's, 
I don't think the draft permit is as clear as it could be regarding the limit for indicator bacteria. And because the limit has been removed, but a requirement to monitor and report the pollutant remains, while it's intended to be zero, I, I want to acknowledge the, the absence of that clear limit creates ambiguity. And so effluent violations for intracoxy continued to occur after domestic wastewater discharges had supposedly ceased, which in the period of time that we're charged to review applications for no increased renewals, I think puts us on the wrong side of the line on that analysis. So I would prefer that the permit were, were less ambiguous on this point to address that concern. Uh, I also have questions about whether the application materially changes the pattern or place of discharge. In the existing permit, there are currently three external outfalls associated with the permit, and the draft permit would propose to bring this down to one outfall. And it appears to contemplate the future use of the decant pond after decommissioning for stormwater storage before discharge. Uh, finally, I'm concerned about, as I've alluded to already, the, the site's past violations. The past owners allowed for unauthorized discharge of the industrial wastewater onto an adjacent property and bypass treatment at the decant pond, discharging approximately 162 million gallons of untreated wastewater and stormwater into Corpus Christi Bay. Uh, and my understanding is the requested authorization for their intended future use of this decamp pond would require some work and approval from our staff before it would be uh, ready to offer additional protection against the, the past failure within that period of time. Um, so I'll stop there and just say I, I think I had a different view. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, I think my view more closely aligns with the chairman's view on this. Thank you. Um, appreciate your, your perspective on that. And we have three commissioners for a reason, I guess. And so thanks, thanks for that. Um, and um, just for the record, I, don't, I personally don't subscribe to the facts and the law as, as you've outlined them. But um, yeah, I, I think we're at a point where I might just go ahead and offer a motion and, and uh, we can take our appropriate votes on it. Um, colleagues, I find that there's no right to a hearing on this application pursuant to Texas Water Code Section 26.028D and 30 Texas Administrative Code Section 55.201I5. I further move that we deny all hearing requests, issue the renewal of TIPTES permit number WQ00046460000, to Chenier Land Holdings LLC as recommended by the Executive Director and that we adopt the executive director's response to comments. I'll second the motion. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Nay. We have a rare nay. The motion carries. Um, Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next item. That takes us to our enforcement docket. And those are items five through 16. And we have the executive director staff here to present these items. Good morning. Good morning, chairman, commissioners, general counsel, and public interest counsel. For the record, my name is Michael Parrish of the enforcement division. And with me today are Amy Sedemeyer, also of the enforcement division, and Gitanjali Yadav of the Litigation Division, representing the Executive Director. Pending before you are items 5 through 16. The total assessed administrative penalties are $231,138 with $33,584 deferred, $110,686 applied towards supplemental environmental projects, and $86,000 $868 to the general revenue. We respectfully request approval of these items and are available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Parrish. I have none. Any questions, colleagues? No, thank you. Seeing none, Ms. Smith, is anybody signed in to speak? Um, on item five, we have an individual who signed in and indicated that they're available to answer questions, but nobody is asked to address the commission. Thank you. Mr. Arthur, what says OPIC? Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. 
For the record, I'm Garrett Arthur, TCEQ Public Interest Counsel. OPIC supports adoption of these enforcement orders as presented by ED staff. Thank you, colleagues, I do as well. I move that we adopt items five through 16 as recommended today by the executive director. Second that motion. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next items. That takes us to items 17 through 20, which are the quadrennial rule reviews for 30 Texas Administrative Code, chapters 60, 213, 230, and 307. Um, we don't have anyone, oh, sorry, the executive director staff is here to present them. Good Please. morning. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. On behalf of the executive director, I'm Gwen Rico with the General Law Division. Pending before you are items 17 through 20, the adopted rule reviews of 30 Texas Administrative Code Chapter 60, Compliance History, Chapter 213, Edwards Aquifer, Chapter 230, Groundwater Availability Certificate Certifications for Platting, and Chapter 307, Texas Surface Water Quality Standards. As required by Texas Government Code Sections 2001.039, Executive Director staff conducted a rule review for these chapters to determine if the need for the rules within these chapters continue to exist. The proposed notices for these reviews were published in the September 8th, 2023 issue of the Texas Register with 30-day comment periods. No comments were received for these rule reviews. Based on the review of these chapters, the executive director has determined that the reasons for the rules in chapters 60, 213, 230, and 307 continue to exist and changes to the rules identified as part of this rule review process will be addressed in a separate rulemaking action in accordance with the Texas Administrative Procedure Act. In conclusion, we respectfully recommend approval of the adoption of the rule reviews of chapters 60, 213, 230, and 307. Additionally, staff request authorization to make non-substantive revisions necessary to comply with Texas register requirements. Thank you. The project managers and staff attorneys assigned are here to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Rico. Colleagues, any questions? Ms. Smith, has anybody signed in to speak? No one signed in on these. Mr. Arthur. OPIC agrees that the reasons for initially adopting the Chapter 60, 213, 230, and 307 rules continue to exist, and we support readoption of the rules in each of these chapters. Colleagues, I agree. I would readopt these rule, rule chapters. I move that we adopt these rules. Any more comments? I move that we adopt the rules and readopt the rules in 30 Texas Administrative Code Chapter 60, 213, 230, and 307 without amendment as recommended by the Executive Director. I second the motion. I, I love the specificity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion aye. carries. Ms. Smith, please call the next item. Uh, the next item, the item 21, is our public comment session. We currently don't have anyone signed in to um, speak at our public comment session, but we will pause and allow the opportunity for, for someone to jump up and, and come talk to us. Is there anybody who's joined us virtually who'd like to address the commission? All right. Hearing none and seeing no one approach the podium. Ms. Smith, I'll ask you to please call the next items. Um, the next items are for closed session and the commission will meet in closed session in room 4222 in building F at, um, shall we say, 1030 yeah. as permitted by the Open Meetings Act, including Texas Government Code sections 551071 and 074 to take up and consider matters pursuant to items number 22 through 25 as posted and noticed. Thank you, Ms. Smith. The time is 1014 a.m. We are in recess.
The commission met in room 422 in building F for closed session from 1028 AM until 1041 AM on item numbers 23 and 24 as posted in notice pursuant to Texas Government Code section 551074. No action was taken. The agenda stands adjourned and the time is 1114.